Okay, we're on to the final chapter of Further Stats 2, which is the T distribution. Now, the T distribution, I think, is just a really fascinating area. And it's the final distribution that we'll be looking at here. And at the end of the playlist, I'm going to summarize all of the distributions and when we use them. So you can look out for that because I think in Stats 2, Further Stats 2, once you've figured out which distribution or which thing you need to do, the maths is actually quite straightforward and quite simple. So we're going to start off with a little bit of a story here. In the early 1900s, a man named William Seeley Gossett was working for Guinness Brewery in Dublin. You've probably seen Guinness before, maybe you've even tried some, um, not that you should have done if you're under 18. Um, and he was working for this company, for Guinness, and he was looking for better methods to try and estimate the means and variances of ingredients quality, but he was only using small samples from normally distributed populations. And this was something that became crucial in giving Guinness the edge in quality control. So what he wanted to do was take a sample from a particular ingredient that was being offered to him and he wanted to try and estimate the quality of that ingredient and almost um, and also how much the quality of that ingredient was going to vary so that he could select the best ingredients to be able to make this this stout it's called like a type of beer kind of thing but because Guinness was very protective of its brewing techniques, and some also suggest that they wanted to hide the fact that they were even using a statistician to their advantage, Gossett had to publish his work under the pseudonym Student in 1908. So Guinness had this rule where they didn't allow anyone who worked for them to be able to publish anything under their name. And some people think it was actually because they didn't want to even show to other breweries that they were using maths to try and make their, their products even better. They thought that that would give them an edge there. So he published all of this work just under the name student in 1908. And actually during this time, he developed the T-distribution that was published as the student. And he developed it by modifying what the normal distribution was to account for the increased uncertainty in small samples. And the name, the student's distribution, stuck because people didn't actually know who had invented this. So it's all about taking a normal distribution and taking into account the fact that when you have a small sample, there is more uncertainty. So a t-distribution is a variation on a normal distribution. And then why does it get the name from student's distribution? Why does it then loop back around and become the t-distribution or the student's t-distribution? So Ronald Fisher of the F distribution that we learned about in the previous playlist, F for Fisher, he named it the t-distribution because t was representing the test statistic. So the t is just referring to the test statistic that we have here. And many people still call this the student's t-distribution today. In fact, in the formula booklet for Excel, the t-distribution table is called the student's t-distribution table. Um, not referring to you as the student, but referring to William Gossett as the sort of original person who looked at this idea back in 1908, trying to make the production of stout even better. So that's kind of a bit of a story. I think that's just a really fascinating story about like how a company in like the 1900s was using statistics to try and get the edge on their competitors and also how it had this quite interesting name where it came from. So we're not going to talk about the, the T distribution yet. We're going to think about why we wouldn't need the T distribution in certain scenarios. So we're going to think about if we had a scenario where we had an unknown variance of a population and we have a very large sample size. In fact, I think we've already looked at some of this kind of stuff in chapter five. Now, we, when we knew the variance of a normal distribution, we could use the fact that the sample means would have a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared over n. So we could therefore easily standardize this using z equals x bar minus mu over the standard deviation, which was sigma over root n. And I've put this in red because in a second we're going to see that it changes. Now, if we don't know the population variance, so if we're saying we have an unknown variance, which is quite likely, we don't usually know the variance of a population. And if you think in the context of William Gossett, he didn't know the variation of people bringing their ingredients to him from the farms. He had to try and work those things out. So if we don't know the population variance, we know that we we know we now know that we can use the sample variance as an approximation for the population variance. But this will only be true for large sample sizes. Or maybe I shouldn't use the word true. I might change that. This will only be good 
for large sample sizes that we've got here. We know that if the sample size is small, then our population, our sample variance is not going to be very accurate. It's going to it's going to vary a lot. So we know that as n gets larger, s squared will more accurately accurately reflect sigma squared. But we don't always have that luxury of being able to take large sample sizes. So if we do have a population with an unknown variance and we can afford to take a large sample from it to estimate the variance, then we can standardize using the exact same thing that we've done before. But instead of there being sigma, we could have S instead. OK, that just kind of makes intuitive sense, I think. Now, the textbook doesn't have questions dedicated to this, but it would be identical to the calculations that we carried out in chapter 6b. I think it was in 6b. Maybe I actually mean 5b for that. Um, let me just quickly look on my contents page. Yeah, not in chapter 6b because that was the F distribution. I actually mean in chapter 5b here, which was us talking about like confidence intervals and things like that. So it's like chapter 5b and chapter 5c that I'm talking about. So large sample sizes and unknown variants, we just pr proceed as before, but we use S instead of sigma. However, they're not really going to answer many questions on these kinds of things. Instead, we're going to be interested now in things where we have small sample sizes. Now, up until this point, when we've had things, we've, we've pretty much just been looking at large sample sizes. If we have an unknown variance and we have a small sample size, we run into a new distribution, which is called the T distribution. And so the biggest giveaway for knowing that it's going to be using a T distribution is if the sample size is small. Now, when sample sizes are smaller, and most people will say that small is less than 30, some say less than 40, and edXL actually doesn't even suggest a number at all, then S, the, pop, the sample um, standard deviation, is unlikely to be that close to sigma. And so using a normal distribution doesn't model it very well. Because if it's unlikely to be close to the variance, sorry, if, if S squared is unlikely to be close to the true variance, then this thing here is not going to be the true value. And so it's not going to match a standardized normal distribution very well. And in fact, what it is going to, it's going to do instead is model something that we're going to model it using the T distribution. So as our um, sample standard deviation is likely to be varying a lot with small samples, we account for that uncertainty by adapting the normal curve. And the way we adapt this normal curve, which you can see down here is this, this black curve that we've got, the way that we account for this by adapting it is we reduce the probability at the center. So if you look at all of these ones that have got colors, the purple, blue, yellow, and green, at the center, all of the probabilities from the, the standardized normal distribution have been squashed down. And we give more of that probability to the tails. So you can see the tail parts that we have here, the colored parts are much higher than the standard normal distribution. So we've taken some of the probability from the top and we've shared it out at the sides like this. And the reason we've done that is because it is now more likely that observations will occur in the tails because we have less certainty with the variance. If we're not so sure about what the variance is going to be, we think, OK, it's probably going to be varying a lot. That means we're probably more likely to be seeing things in the tails than we would be in the middle, like with the normal distribution. So this is the T distribution. It looks like a normal curve. It is symmetrical, which is great. We love the property of it being symmetrical. And the mean is in the middle. But the tails are fatter. Now, actually, that is kind of like a statistical term for us to describe this. If you look at the colored parts compared to the black part, they are fatter at the tails. There's kind of more probability in that section. There's more area in that part. And the hump that's in the middle of the normal distribution has been squashed down too. Now, the exact shape or the distribution will depend on the size of the sample. And these things are to do with the samples that we've got here. So you can see that when we have just, if this is actually corresponding to two things in the sample, this is corresponding to four, nine, and 21 things. So we're already getting an idea of how the sample size will relate to the degrees of freedom. We can see that as you increase 
the number of things in the sample, it's going to start looking more and more similar to the normal curve. Like the green one is almost looking the same as the normal curve, uh, the normal curve, whereas say the blue one is quite different to it. It's quite squashed in the middle and we've got these fatter tails for it. So I've just kind of described that, that the larger the sample, the closer it will resemble Z. In fact, as n goes towards infinity, as you take a really, really big sample, the distribution, the t distribution, literally becomes the normal standardized z, uh, sorry, the standardized normal distribution, which we call z. Now, the different shapes of the t distribution are defined, as I just mentioned, by the number of degrees of freedom. For a sample size of n, the t distribution has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And that's kind of reminiscent of the fact that when we're doing um, the population, the sample variance that we're dividing by n minus 1 instead. So that's one of the things we need to remember. If the sample size is n, the number of degrees of freedom is always one less than that. And we would write that as a t n minus 1 distribution. So whatever the bit in the subscript next to the t is tells us how many degrees of freedom there are. And it's always one less than the sample size. The degrees of freedom is one less than the sample size. So before we actually do some calculations with this, I just wanted to show you the part that gets given to you in the textbook. And then this is to do with the normal distribution that we've got here. So what you'll see is the degrees of freedom for it are down the side. And then we have the probabilities that it exceeds a certain value along the top. So I could say for four degrees of freedom, the probability that it is 5% bigger than two point, sorry, the probability it's bigger than 2.132 is 5%. So I'm going to sketch it over the top and then get rid of it. I am saying that for this T distribution, the probability, and this is a T4 distribution, the probability it's bigger than 2.132 is 5%. We're kind of getting used to how we read these tables that we have here. Now, the thing I wanted to show to you is that how for large values of n, the t distribution starts to resemble the z distribution. So let's have a look. For some large values of n, let's just look right down at the bottom. We're saying that 1.289 is the probability, the probability above 1.289 is 10%. Now, if I look in the normal distribution one and I see where it's 10%, I've got that the probability above 1.2816 is 10%. So let's just quickly see that again. We've said the probability in the T distribution that something is bigger than 1.289 is 10%. And here 1.2816 is 10%. So they're pretty close. But the further that you go to the tails, the more that discrepancy is going to be there. So if we have a look at our, say, 0 0.005, Let's have a look at 0.005, which is 2.617. 0.005 is this part that we have here, is 2.5758. Well, 2.5758, 2.5758, it's pretty close to 2.617. But you can see it's starting to kind of move a little bit further apart for these things, that they're not that close to each other. But basically, if n becomes large, it's going to become very, very, very close. So let's think about all the things we're going to be doing in this final chapter. We have got the mean of a normal distribution with unknown variance. This is going to fit, feel really similar to exercise 5b when we're doing stuff like confidence intervals for the mean. So we'll be doing some confidence intervals with this kind of stuff. We'll be doing hypothesis testing for the mean with an unknown variance. This is going to feel similar to when we've done hypothesis testing with the normal distribution. We'll then do something called the paired t-test. This is basically like the difference between means. We'll do difference between means. Again, it feels like that same thing from chapter five. And we'll do hypothesis testing for the difference between means. And that comes up again. It feels like revisiting lots of these things that we've got here. And then at the end, I will do a big summary of all of further stats two's distributions. And we'll do some exam questions that go alongside that. So if you come back in the next video, we're going to be starting to think, how do we use this table? How do we use our calculators to be able to figure out all of these t values and probabilities?